Section 18 of The True Stories of Girl Heroines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Val Roth. True Stories of Girl Heroines by Evelyn Everett Green. Chapter 18 Mona Drummond. You are a villain! spoke the hot-tempered Irish maiden with a glow in her eyes before which the evil-looking man before her quailed, although the scowl upon his face was an ugly thing to see. You are a thief and a villain, and I will see the governor myself and tell him what you have been doing. Oh, it is infamous, infamous, my poor father. The girl put her hands before her eyes for a moment to hide the tears that rose to them. Mona had the tall, graceful figure, regular noble features, and great gray eyes of the typical Irish maiden. She was standing beneath the walls and within the precincts of Lifford Jail. Before her was a man of evil aspect, who wore the dress of a jailer and who swung a great bundle of keys in his hand. He had come forward confidently enough to meet the girl, smiling and almost cringing. But when she suddenly blazed forth at him in this impetuous fashion, he shrank and cowered before her as though he knew himself guilty of some dire offense. You have been taking our money all these years, money so hardly earned, so sorely spared. You have sworn that you spent it on providing better food and lodging for my dear father, and all the while you lied, you lied, black-hearted villain that you are. He has never been the better for it by one loaf of bread, by one flask of wine. You have stolen every coin. You have defrauded him and lied to us. The girl was shaken by the storm of her anger. The man stood before her, tongue-tied and cowed. He was not ashamed of his villainy. He was too hardened a wretch for that. But he was afraid lest the thing should become known to the governor, who was a just and humane man and who from time to time had been known to admit the prisoner's daughter to his presence at her earnest request. I am going to see the governor about it, concluded the girl with a scathing look. He is a just man and merciful. He will at least know what to advise in the future. Fury and terror filled the man's face. He recoiled a little and fingered his heavy keys as though he meditated a savage assault upon the girl standing before him in this great solitary courtyard. What if he silenced her voice forever? Who would be the wiser? He shot a quick glance round him as if to assure himself there were no eyes upon him. And Mona at the same moment gave a half-scared, half-defiant gaze around herself. Some instinct warned her of his fell purpose, and she knew she was no match for him. But to quail or cower would but bring down the meditated blow upon her head. She stood with her clear gaze full upon his eyes, holding them as men in the wilderness can sometimes hold a wild beast in thrall by the fixed stare of unwavering will. She was not many paces from the little door by which she had entered. If she could gain that, she might be able to turn and fly. She made one backward step towards it. But even as she moved, she felt rather than saw that he was in the act of springing. And at that she darted backwards, tore open the door and was through it before he could reach her. But she could not close it behind her to draw the bolt. He was too quick for that. She almost felt his hands at her throat when suddenly she heard him utter a yell of terror and turning saw him struggling in the grip of a tall and powerful young man who must have been coming toward the door close under the wall for she had not seen him as she darted out and yet he had been there to catch her pursuer as he followed the terror of the man surprised mona as did also the fact that he made no resistance when once he saw into whose hands he had fallen his arms dropped to his sides and his jaw fell staring at the young athlete who had him in his grip as though bereft of sense. "'My father shall hear of this, sirrah," spoke the young youth with a final shake as he let the wretch go. Then he turned to Mona and doffed his hat with a courtly air. "'He has not hurt you, fair maid, I trust.' "'Oh, no, sir, I am not hurt. I thank you from my heart for this timely aid.' And what do you do in this gloomy place, if I may ask the question? What errand has brought so fair a flower within the portals of a prison? 
At that question, Mona's eyes filled with sudden tears, and she turned away her head to hide them. Alas, dear sir, mine is a sorrowful errand, and I have not been able to accomplish it, for we have been basely tricked and cozened these many years by yonder miscreant, who is slinking away now like a whipped hound. I would fain see the good governor and tell my tale of woe to him. He was kind before, and it may be his will to find a way to help me now. I am his son, answered the young man eagerly. I shall take you to him speedily, and as we go you shall tell me your sad tale. Believe me, I will befriend you if I can. Have you some relative immured within the walls of this grim place? Alas, sir, my father, she answered with brimming eyes, and he has been here so many long weary years. I was but little more than a child when they took him away and brought him hither, and now I am within a year of twenty summers. My poor father, my poor innocent father. Of what crime does he stand accused? asked the young man with ready interest. Of no crime save that of holding the Presbyterian faith, she answered. That is all the wrong he has done, believing it and teaching it, for he is a minister of the word, and our church at Rappo was his charge, and we were happy, and he was beloved by all. But you must know how when the king was restored to his kingdom over the water after the death of the Iron Cromwell, he or his ministers issued edicts in this land, as well as in England and Scotland, for the re-establishment of the prelacy. And those who desire to worship after their own fashion, and not according to the episcopal forms, are sorely beset and persecuted. I know, I know, answered her companion quickly and with sympathy. And so your father was one of those who suffered for his faith. Yes, there were four of them, answered Mona, her tongue unloosened by the friendliness of this stranger. And Bishop Leslie had led them all cast into prison at the same time. They lie in this grim jail, and God alone knows when they will be suffered to come forth. But we heard that the prisoners here were harshly treated, and had scarcely the necessities of life supplied them. It was after hearing this that I went one day and craved speech of the governor. I did first beg him to let me see my dear father, but that he might not permit. He said, however, that I might speak to the jailer who had charge of him, and obtain through him such things as we could make shift to purchase for him, to lessen his privations and sufferings. The man promised faithfully, and every penny we can spare has been scraped and hoarded and given over to him. And we believed that father had such comforts as they could get for him. We believed that till a few days ago, and then, and then... The girl's voice grew husky. The bright tears rolled down her cheeks. Her companion took the words out of her mouth. You heard in some roundabout fashion that your money had gone into the pockets of that wretch, and that your father had in no wise profited thereby. Yes, yes, that was it. One of our friends has obtained his liberty. They say there is hope that others will follow. We saw him. He came to us. He has now and then had a brief moment of speech with my dear father. Nothing has ever reached him from without. He has suffered all the rigors of his harsh captivity. And you did have the bravery to go to yon miscreant who had the charge of your father here in this prison, and who has appropriated the money and tell him of his ill deeds? And this is what has awakened his evil passions and ferocity? This is what has made him chase you forth and seek to do you hurt? I told him I would go to the governor, panted Mona with hot and indignant eyes. And then I saw that he would fly at me, and so I sought to reach the door ere he had time. But he would have done me mischief had it not been for your good help. Then come now to my father and tell him all the tale, cried the young man, whose name was Derek Adair and we will see if some way cannot be found for mending matters for your good father. At least that rogue of a jailer shall receive his due reward or punishment. Colonel Adair, the governor who had been kind to Mona before, listened very readily now to her tale, and was exceedingly displeased at what he heard as the action of the warder. Of course, he knew well the abuses that prevailed in all prisons at this epoch and long afterwards. But though unable to institute any drastic measures of reform, he was able to punish individual transgressors when peculation had been proved against them. 
And he told Mona that he would see in future that her alms were rightly bestowed for the relief of the prisoner, adding that he hoped soon to see him set at liberty. I am perplexed to know why the bishop speaks of releasing the other three ministers he sent hither. Indeed, one was set free a short while since, as you know. But there is no mention of that grace being extended to your father, and yet his case was in no way different from that of others. Can you explain wherefore he is differently treated? A hot flash dyed Mona's cheek, and then the flash of anger awoke in her eyes. She spoke almost as if to herself. Oh, infamous, infamous, the coward! Did he indeed speak truth when he threatened? I did not believe he had such power. Of what do you speak, my child? asked the governor kindly. Trust me, and tell me all. You shall not regret your confidence. Oh, sir, cried Mona, struggling against her excitement and anger. It is the doing of that wicked son of the bishop. He professes to love me. He waylays me sometimes in my walks, and talks as he has no right to do. He is a great man's son. I am a poor minister's daughter. He declares he wishes to wed me, but I will not listen. He is a bad man. I fear him, and I hate him. And it was but a little while back that he threatened me. He said that till I would give him the promise, he asks, my father should never be released. I did not think as he spoke that he had power to contrive such a cruel thing. But here are others going forth, and my poor father kept still in ward. Oh, why are such cruel things suffered to be? And what answer did you make him, my child? asked the colonel. The same that I have ever done, sir. That I have no love for him. Nay, I hate him, and I fear him. I will never trust him. I will never be his wife. He knows his father would oppose such a marriage. It is always of elopement that he talks. But I will not hear. He is wicked, cruel. But my father, must he suffer too? Nay, that he shall not. I myself will obtain justice, cried Derek with sudden energy. And as Mona lifted her beautiful face and gazed at him through her tears, he went on gently. It may indeed be that I can help thee, sweet maid. For when my visit here is ended, I return to Dublin, where I am finishing my course of study at Trinity College, and also acting in the capacity of private tutor to a great nobleman's son. This nobleman has much influence with the government, and through interesting my pupil in your father's story, I doubt not I can bring this tale to the ears of those in power, and so effect his release. Therefore, weep no more, fair Mistress Mona. Wait in patience for a few more weeks, and trust me not to forget your case, and to do all that one man may to right a wrong. So Mona went home lightened of a sore burden, her heart full of thanksgiving, and when next the bishop's son waylaid her and promised to obtain her father's freedom if she would but consent the proposed elopement with him, she answered him with steady scorn, looking so beautiful in her simple maidenly dignity and indignation that the baffled man stood watching her with a look of mingled longing and anger. You obtain his liberty. It is you who are the present cause of his continued bondage. Why is he not released with the others? Oh, lie not to me. I know, I know. Wicked men do these things daily, and God does not smite at once. But the day will come, the day of vengeance, when the wicked will be overthrown and the righteous will shine forth like stars in the firmament of heaven. He continued to gaze at her with an expression that would have terrified many girls. But Mona was not afraid. She felt she had another champion now, and she feared no longer the machinations of this bad man. She had seen Derek Adair several times during the interval that had elapsed between her visit to the prison and the present interview with the bishop's son. He had come to see her mother and assure her that the prisoner had been taken to a more comfortable lodging and had received better food and bedding that had been his heretofore. All the money sent by the careful family was now suffered to reach the prisoner himself, and his condition was greatly ameliorated thereby. The dishonest jailer had been sent away, 
Derek told them on his second visit, and he added he would like to make a clean sweep of many others, but even his father had not power for that. Mona's heart was now relieved of the heaviest part of its burden. She was no longer afraid of the bishop or his son. She was no longer torn in twain by the feeling that she might be standing between her father and his liberty, and that perhaps filial duty demanded the sacrifice from her of wedding a man she feared and hated. But she so distrusted the bishop's son that she could never think of his proposal without a shudder. And now what joy it was to feel that their cause had been taken up by a stalwart champion and that justice might be looked for without such a terrible sacrifice on her part. Mona was a fearless girl who had always led a free and hearty life. She had a very kind heart and a skillful pair of hands, and wherever there was sickness in any of the cabins or cottages around, it was the custom to send for her, and she never failed to answer the summons. Often she was thus away from her home for a whole day or for a night or two, and no anxiety would be aroused by her non-return from a sickbed. When possible, she would send a message to this effect if she were detained, but no real trouble would be caused by her absence at night, should she have gone forth in response to a summons and not returned. One afternoon, she received a message to ask her to come to a sick woman of some distance, and as she kissed her mother, she told her not to be anxious if she did not come home till morning. As if she were detained late, it would be better to stay the night. When, however, she arrived at the house, to her great surprise, it was all shut up and empty. Could it be possible that the woman had died suddenly? She asked herself and shook the door of the cabin. It yielded to her hand, and she went in. But there was no sick person on the bed. The place was neatly swept up and set in order, just as though the inmate had gone away for a visit. A sudden odd sense of uneasiness came over Mona, a feeling of having been tricked. But who could have plotted to deceive her? The little boy who brought the message certainly delivered it in all good faith, and she had never questioned him as to who had bidden him bring it. But now there was but one thing to do, to get home as fast as possible before it grew quite dark. She turned to leave the cottage when a shadow fell upon her from the open doorway. And with a shudder of horror, she saw standing there the broad, squat figure of the wicked jailer, whose dismissal from the prison had been brought about through her instrumentally. He gazed at her whitening face with an evil leer, and then made a wild beast spring at her. My turn now, you hussy! My turn now! So you thought to ruin an honest man and set a defiance a powerful one? But we will tame you between us, you little tiger cat. We will have our revenge. Even as he spoke, the man with practiced hands secured the girl's slim wrists and clasped a pair of manacles upon them. He then bound them behind her back and, after thrusting a gag into her mouth, he led her out of the house to a short distance where in a ruined shed a horse was tied up, lifting her upon its broad back and springing up behind her himself. He set the creature at a steady gallop, and Mona felt herself being carried farther and farther away from home and friends in the cruel grip of this evil man, who was plainly acting as the tool of the bishop's son. It was a terrible thought, but Mona knew her only chance lay in keeping her courage and self-control. Whether anything could save her from her fate, she did not know, and entrusted her case to the god of all the earth. And having partially quieted herself by this, she opened her eyes and scanned the country through which they were passing with the keenest and most eager glances. There was little to encourage her. All was bare and bleak and deserted. The man was evidently taking an unfrequented route. He desired, no doubt, to avoid encounters upon the road, although in the darkness no one was likely to note that he carried a prisoner before him. And Mona could give no sign and speak no word. The light faded, the moon rose, and still they traveled on and on. Mona began to lose knowledge of the country through which she was passing. She fancied that they were on the main road to Dublin, but she could not be absolutely sure. It was like enough that she would be taken to a great city, where all trace of her would easily be lost. Sometimes, as the long strange hours wore by, her heart almost fainted within her. 
But then again she told herself that to lose courage and hope would be to lose all. If she could but put her captor off his guard, perhaps things might yet go well. Some chance of escape might offer itself. They could not travel all night without a halt. Man and beast must be fed. But as Mona saw in the distance a few twinkling lights, she pretended to be more heavily asleep than before. And for some time she had feigned drowsiness and broken slumber, and let herself rest heavily against the rider behind, who evidently had no great relish for the burden that he did not dare to drop. At last they reached the inn, and the man wrapped the girl up from head to foot in his great riding cloak, taking care that her face should not be seen. Mona heard him mutter to himself, She is in a swoon, so much the better for me. I can take my ease after this weary ride, and if she comes to herself, she can neither speak nor use her hands. She must needs lie as I have placed her. I will tie her feet to make all safe. Then, lifting her in his arms, he cried to the host, I have got a sick daughter here I am taking to be cared for by my good mother. I will not bring her inside, lest the distemper be catching. I will lay her comfortably on the straw in this barn and let her rest there for an hour. She is in a sleep all the while, and she will want nothing till I come out again. So Mona was laid down on the straw in the empty barn, and the hint the man had dropped was quite enough to keep all persons away from her. Under pretext of wrapping her up warmly, her captor tied her feet together securely, and there she lay, gagged and bound and helpless in the silence and the darkness. Yet she was hardly alone before she had struggled up into a sitting posture and had flung off the heavy folds of the cloak. Then, very cautiously and carefully, and with some pain, she made the experiment she had been longing to do all the while, to try and twist her slim hands out of the manacle that encircled her wrist. Mona, though a tall girl, was possessed of very delicate feet and hands, and her bones were small and flexible. Had less been at stake, she would have given up the task in despair, for the pain was severe, and she was altogether uncertain of success in the end, and feared that her hand was becoming swollen in the effort. But in spite of the pain, she persevered, and at last she drew forth her right hand free and would have cried aloud but for the gag in her mouth. To release the other hand when its fellow was free was an easier matter, and then she quickly unfastened the gag and drew a breath of deep relief as she flung it from her. It was hard still to be delayed by the knots that bound her feet, but they gave way at last to her strenuous efforts, and Mona stood up free and fetterless in the darkness of the barn. Thank God, thank God! God, she cried in her heart, yet she knew her perils were not over yet. She must creep away from the inn and hide herself. But her persecutor would soon discover her flight and would pursue her. She dared not take the horse as she feared to be seen if she approached the stable. All she ventured to do was to slip out of the barn through a broken portion of the wall, and looking well about her and taking her direction from the friendly moon, she sped like a shadow along the road she had recently so painfully traversed. She did not dare to leave it unless forced to do so. The treacherous bogland lay about her, and she knew nothing of the safe tracks across that were familiar in her own locality. The moon that gave her light would serve also to illuminate her own figure for her pursuer when he should discover her escape. Swiftly as the girl raced onwards in the moonlight, she felt ever as though that strong horse and his wicked rider must soon be at her heels. Then will I plunge into the bog and hide me, or perish there, cried Mona, clenching her teeth. But never, never, never shall he lay his hands upon me again. I fear not death, at least but little. I fear only to fall into the hands of wicked men. Suddenly, upon the far horizon of her vision, there loomed up a little black speck, and Mona's heart gave a throb of joy. It was surely some traveller approaching from the opposite direction. Upon his mercy she would cast herself, whoever he might be. No son of Aaron would refuse to champion her in such an hour as this, and no traveller along these lonely roads ever went unarmed. 
Yet, even as her quick eyes beheld this traveler approaching from one direction, her quick ears caught the sound of horses' hooves galloping furiously behind her from the other. Gathering all her energies together for a last effort, the girl sped forward like an arrow from a bow, her light figure clearly standing out in the bright moonlight. It seemed to her as though the traveler saw something of the pursuit, for instantly his horse sprang forward at a grand gallop. The fugitive fled onwards, gasping exhausted, and then in a moment she found herself upheld by a strong arm. She leaned almost helplessly against her preserver, and a familiar, agitated voice exclaimed in her ear, Mona, Mona, sweetheart, what ails thee? The jailer, the bishop's son, they tricked me, they caught me, panted the girl. He carried me off, and I have escaped. He is coming after me now. Oh, do not let him have me. Kill me first, but never let me fall alive into his hands. You give yourself to me, sweet Mona? Then I will hold you against all the world. Derek held her with his left arm and leveled his pistol with his right. Dare to come one step nearer and I fire. You know, fellow, whether or not I shall miss my mark. The two men stood looking at each other in deep silence for a few seconds. Deadly rage and baffled hate on one face, on the other stern wrath and dauntless determination. At last, the hireling with an oath turned his horse and galloped back the way he had come. Revenge was sweet, and so was gold, but he cared not to purchase either at the price of life or limb. Thou art safe, sweetheart, said Derek, bending his head and touching her cheek with his lips. Heaven be thanked that I was so hindered in my start for Dublin this day that I had perforce to wait for moonrise to sally forth. And now I will take thee home, dear love, and we will tell thy tale to my father, who will see thee safeguarded in the future. Derek Adair quickly procured the release of Mona's father and married the daughter in the following year. Later on, after the rather tragic death of Bishop Leslie, caused doubtless by the conduct of his son, who was forced to fly the country after some notorious ill deed, the vacant office was bestowed upon Derek, now a rising light in the church, and he became Bishop of Rappo, and his wife ruled in the old castle, which was the home of its prelates. Once a wretched-looking beggarman crawled to the gate as she was passing forth and fell exhausted at her feet, asking alms. She gazed at his face a while, and he into hers. They knew each other, and the wretched man cowered against the stones, while the lady hastened indoors to set servants or dogs upon him as the wretched man believed, for he was none other than the ex-jailer who had sought to do her so much ill. But quickly she returned with food and wine, and a handful of silver. She set the basket before him and poured the money into his hands, stretched forth in supplication, and she gently made answer to his faltering words of prayer. Have no fear, my poor fellow. May God forgive you as I do. Eat and drink and refresh yourself ere you go upon your way. And you will not punish me? You will not take your revenge? She looked gravely and sorrowfully at him as she answered. I think that God has punished you. That is his office, not ours. And for the rest, that is my revenge. End of section 18。section 19 of True Stories of Girl Heroines。This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Suzanne Axt. True Stories of Girl Heroines by Evelyn Everett Green. Jessie Varco. There goes the witch's daughter. Yonder goes the witch's maid. Have a stone at the likes of her lads. Tiddy fiddy as such spawn should live. Poor Jessie had grown up with taunts like these in her ears. 
till she had come to be too well used to them to pay much heed. Sometimes a stone would strike her, but she could throw as well as any lad along the coast, and she had proved as much upon the persons of her persecutors many a time and oft. On the whole, the children and the lads and girls of Morristow had come to think it best to leave Jessie alone especially since it had been whispered that she was learning the black art from her grandmother, the black witch of the neighborhood, and could overlook an enemy or curse him and his goods and smite his crops with blasting and mildew. So Jessie's life was perforce a lonely one. No kith or kin had she ever known save her old grandmother, who lived in the hut upon the rolling downs land, not far from the margin of the cliffs. The old woman went out by night to gather herbs and simples, and these she brewed over the fire by day, muttering her strange incantations the while. Although she was known as the black witch in her own neighborhood, there were many persons who brought her wares and found them excellent for sprains and rheumatize and the like. But nobody visited in a friendly way at the lonely hut save certain wild and fierce-looking men who always came at night and were generally laden with packs of merchandise which they hid away in some secret hiding place beneath the floor of the cottage. This much Jessie knew from peeping through the crevices in the floor of the upper room where she slept. She was never permitted to be present when these men came. She was sent to bed up the rickety ladder, and the ladder was invariably removed, so that she could not get down if she would, the bolt in the trap door by which she reached her attic being always drawn by the grandmother. As the child grew to girlhood, she began to understand very well the nature of these visits from seafaring men. They brought smuggled goods to be concealed beneath the witch's hut, well knowing that nobody would willingly run the risk of being cursed or overlooked by the old woman. Moreover, Jessie had reason to believe that the cottage masked an entrance into a very large cave, which was probably a valuable hiding place. For she always noted the extreme civility with which the rough men treated her grandmother, and how anxious they seemed to please her in the bargains that they made. Nor was Jessie in any way disturbed by the knowledge of what was going on. Smuggling was a regular trade all along the coast, and she regarded it as a matter of course. As the old grandmother grew more and more infirm, Jessie was of necessity taken more into her confidence and soon found out that her suspicions were quite correct. The old woman received the contraband goods from the smugglers and hid them in the recesses of the great cave, the secrets of which were known only to herself. And though very occasionally the revenue officers came to the cottage and insisted upon examining the place most carefully, they never discovered the secret hiding place for the small cave was only the antechamber to a very much larger one behind, and the entrances to the latter were so cleverly masked that it was long before even Jessie could learn the trick of the sliding shale of rock, though she had been shown it many times by her grandmother. Exciting scenes were often witnessed along the coast in those days. The bloody scenes were enacted between the smugglers and the gauges, or revenue officers, in which lives were often lost. One gauger, more resolute than some of his predecessors, after having killed many desperate smugglers himself, was dragged bodily into a boat that he was pursuing, whilst his head was chopped off on the gunwale and flung into the sea. The Black Prince was a trim little vessel that did a great deal of illicit traffic all along the coast at that time, and was well known to every man, woman, and child in Morristow. Horwell was the name of her captain. A daring fellow he was, 
and one of the most popular smugglers in those parts, free with his money, free with his contraband spirits, making friends with villagers, parson, and sexton alike, and even bribing old Tom Hockday, this latter functionary, to let him deposit his kegs and bales in the church till he could find a convenient opportunity of getting them away to old Mother Varco's or some other convenient hiding place. The farmers would lend him their stout little horses to lay up with his goods from over the water, and the horses would be so shaved and soaked that they were slippery as eels, and being accustomed to follow some well-trained animals, would gallop away to the hiding place, safe from any hostile clutches. In scenes such as these, Jessie had been reared, and although she herself was something of an outcast in the scattering community where she dwelt, her sympathies, such as they were, were for a time all with the smugglers, whom she regarded as friends, till something came to change the face of affairs for her. It seemed to begin from one Sunday morning, where Jessie, for a wonder, went to the church in spite of her natural timidity, and faced the jeers of the boys and girls, and the suspicious looks of their parents. She often hung about the little windswept church while Sunday service was going on, feeling in her heart a vague yearning after intercourse with her own kind, and a longing for some knowledge of the mysteries of religion but she seldom ventured inside the porch. It might not have done so today had it not been that there was a little lad with curly hair and blue eyes, whose face she did not know, whom she encountered when not far from the building, and who began to talk with her in an unsuspicious and friendly fashion that went straight to her heart. Before they had got to the church, she had gathered that the boy was the son of one of the revenue officers lately come into the neighborhood, and that he often went out in the cutters that pursued the smuggling boats, or hunted the coast for them. The fearless little fellow had had some adventures already, which he retailed to Jesse with great gusto, and remarked that he did not think the people of Morristow liked him or his father. To this Jesse answered, that they did not like her either, and this seemed a bond drawing the pair together, so that when they reached the church they passed in together, and sat side by side in a shadowy corner behind a big pillar. But the service had not proceeded very far before there was a whisper and then a buzz at the porch door, and one by one folks slipped from their seats and stole out till at last only Jessie and Tim, as the boy told her he was called, and the parson and clerk were left. And the parson shut up his book and whipped off his surplice, saying, Sure, there is something amiss, and I must needs go and see. The churchyard overlooked the sea, and there, sure enough, was the black prince close under the land, and a revenue cutter in full chase and so near that all held their breath to watch. And Tim seized hold of Jessie's hands and cried, They'll get her! They'll get her! Oh, why was not I there with them today? Hush! cried Jessie in sudden fear. Don't let the lads hear you talk so. They'll wring your neck. Some of them as soon as look at you. But look, look! Hoyle's making for the gull rock. They'll never dare follow him there. There's not a man on an adventure near that, save Orhel himself. Then they say the devil has given him a special chart so as he can find his way through the rocks and shells. There, see, the cutter is shearing off. She daren't follow into that surf. The black prince will get off this time. And Jessie's eyes lighted, for her sympathies were with the smugglers, and the congregation assembled on the cliff above gave vent to a lusty chair. And now, my friends, said the parson mildly, let us return and proceed with divine service. He drove the flock back into the building, got into his surplice again, and went on exactly as though there had been no interruption. Here beginneth the second lesson. But though the hardy seaman Horwell escaped the revenue cutter and got safe away, he did not live long after that, 
but was washed overboard on a dark night in a heavy storm, and his nephew and mate, one John Moffat, became commander in his stead. Now Moffat was as daring a smuggler as Horwell had been, but a man of very different temper, fierce, morose, cruel, and of impeccable savageness towards any who had offended him. He had vowed vengeance against all king's officers with whom he should come into conflict. He had tasted once of prison discipline and had had a narrow shave of the gallows. Since then, his violent temper had become increasingly savage. And Rogers, the new officer, the father of Tim, found that he had a foe to deal with as daring as, and even more unscrupulous than, Horwell had been. Moreover, Jessie herself found cause to rue the day when Moffat had been left in command of the Black Prince. Her grandmother was now so infirm that Jessie was obliged to receive the smugglers on their visits and to show them to the hiding place where the contraband goods were hidden. Before long, Moffat began to make love to her in his fierce, masterful way, while Jessie, who feared the fellow and dreaded his visits, shrank from him more and more each time she saw him. She had grown to be a very beautiful girl, in a strange, wild fashion. Her hair was a tawny golden color, and it grew very abundantly, waving down below her waist when the wind caught it and loosened it from her heavy coils, in which it was twisted up. Her eyes seemed to match it in color, as did the thick brows and heavy lashes which veiled the fierce light that sometimes leapt into her glance when she was aroused to anger or hate. The village folk, who liked either dark hair or flaxen locks, had no admiration for Jessie's tawny tresses. But little Tim Rogers told her that she was beautiful and looked like a queen. The girl and little boy had become fast friends, drawn together by their own isolation and by kindred taste. Tim loved the sea and the rocks and the deep clefts and chasms of the coast. And Jessie knew every crevice and cranny as well, as the seagulls themselves. They spent hours together unseen by others, exploring strange spots, telling tales and legends, and growing in friendship every day. As Jessie heard her boyfriend's stories of the hardships of the lives of the king's excise officers, and had the other side of the question unfolded to her, the need for taxes to be levied to keep up England's power and greatness, to preserve her coast from foreign invaders, to enable her to be a power amongst other nations with greater territories, she began to understand that the smugglers were really defrauding the king of his rightful dues, and whatever might be said in favor of the landing of an occasional keg of spirits or bale of silk without paying duty, the regular nefarious traffic of such a vessel as the Black Prince could not be regarded as anything but a wrong done against the king and the nation. It was the easier for Jessie to assimilate this new teaching because of her hatred toward Moffat, which was growing with every visit he paid. Her grandmother was now almost in a dot ridge and was no real protection to the girl, and she sometimes almost feared that Moffat would carry her off to his vessel by force, so wild were his outbreaks of so-called lovemaking and his gust of rage that she repelled him and would have none of his courtship. Jessie's one weapon of defense was in the superstition of the man and his subordinates. They believe that the girl had inherited or had acquired from her grandmother some occult powers and that she had the power to do them some injury by her fiery glance or by word or spell. This knowledge had come accidentally to Jessie from something she had overheard the men saying one to the other, but she had found that it was true 
and that they really had some superstitious fear of her when she flung herself away from Moffat and stood regarding them with her fiery glances of fear and desperations. Afterwards, Jessie made some study of her part and got her grandmother to teach her some spells and some curses. And although still in no small fear of Moffat's evident intention of making her his wife, she felt not quite so unprotected as before. Soon, however, she was to find, as other women have found before her, that the surest way to turn a man's love to hate is to flout him and refuse his courtship. When Jessie, driven one day to bay, flatly refused to marry Moffat and added that she hated him worse than she hated anyone but the devil himself and didn't see as there was much to choose between them. Then the man's passion flamed forth, and the girl might have been killed had not the old woman, suddenly aroused in alarm, begun to curse so lustily, and the seamen were filled with terror and dragged their leader off with them, he shouting out all sorts of threats against Jessie and vowing to be revenged upon her before he had done. It seemed as though disappointed love had filled the man's heart with passions fiercer than their wont. It was but a few days later that Tim told the girl how his father had heard that the black prince was coming in soon with a contraband cargo and that he was going to keep a very sharp lookout for her. I wish your father would kill Mofat and have done with him, cried Jessie with sudden vehemence. "'Why, then, Jessie, you must be on our side,' cried Tim joyfully. "'I never quite liked to ask you before, "'because, of course, all the folks you know are with the smugglers. "'But they don't care for me, and I don't care for them, not a snap,' cried Jessie. "'And as for Moffat, I'll never be quite happy so long as he's above ground. "'But my granny, she cursed him properly the other day.' Maybe that'll bring him bad luck and you good. Then it is true as your grandmother is a witch, Jessie. I don't know. That's what folks say. She don't do nobody no harm as I can see. Nor good neither, save with the herb potions, and them I make as well as she. But she got a few queer books and things she calls charms. She tells me about them sometimes, and she teaches me spells and curses and things, but I'd be half afraid to use them. Suppose they came true. How would one feel? If it were a curse against Mofat and his crew, and it came true, I don't think I should feel very bad, answered Tim. They're a wild bad lot, my father and his men say. The sooner they are got rid of, the better for some of us. Yes, indeed, answered Jesse with a sigh. But they are bad ones to tackle, and no mistake. It was a few days after this, and Jesse was alone in the cave, just as the sunlight was beginning to turn the water red. A load laid upon her heart, she knew not why. She felt as though something terrible were going to happen, but she could not guess what it could be. Suddenly, from over the water, there came the sounds of voices, angry, passionate, triumphant voices, voices that she knew. She ran out of the shelter, and then what did she see? The well-known sails and masts of the Black Prince, almost close in shore, not being pursued by, but in hot pursuit of, the revenue cutter that had been watching for her and had suddenly darted out to seize the prey. Now it was most unusual thing in those days for a smuggling vessel to turn aggressor. They were always built for speed, with a view of getting clear away from the king's boats and officers. The Black Prince had always escaped by speed or seamanship hither. But today it seemed as though the fierce demon of hatred that possessed Moffat had dominated every other feeling. It was he, not the revenue cutter, that was in pursuit. And even as Jessie gained the cave's mouth 
she saw the terrible work of butchery begin. Mofat was the first to spring into the cutter and slash with furious rage at the man Rogers, whose head was laid open by a ghastly blow. Other daring smugglers had followed, and the water was dyed red with something besides the sunset glow. To her horror, Jessie saw that Tim was in the boat, "'Swim for your life,' she cried. "'You can do nothing there. Jesse is here. Jesse will help you.' The boy heard. The men did not. They were otherwise engrossed. The boy, powerless to help either father or friends, obeyed the call that had reached him. And as he dropped silently over the gunwale of the boat and struck out, Jesse plunged into the sea from her rock and swam bravely out to meet him, uncertain whether or no he might have received some wound. And it was well she did, for though unwounded, the boy had had a severe blow upon the arm and was only able to swim a short distance without feeling the numbness and powerlessness come again upon him. But Jessie was beside him. She could swim like a fish, and even weighed by her clothes, could give her shoulder to Tim to support his useless arm, whilst she made her way with swift, strong strokes toward one of the darkest and narrowest crevices between the frowning cliffs, where she thought she and he might be safe from pursuit. No direct rays of light came into this narrow cave, and there was a ledge of rock upon which she hoisted Tim, and where she scrambled herself when he was safe both gasping and exhausted, but as they hoped, safe. Jessie, you have saved me. How brave you are, cried Tim. But Jessie suddenly laid a hand upon his mouth. Hist, be quiet, she whispered. They are coming after us. I hear their voices and the plash of oars. It was too true. Mofat's wicked eyes had seen the golden head of Jessie, and he had missed the boy from the bottom of the boat where he had been knocked over. They are in here, cried a cruel voice. I saw them go myself. We have them here like rats in a trap. Tim, have you a knife? asked Jesse between shut teeth. The boy was trembling, but he did not give way. He pulled a little dirk from his belt. Yes, but I must defend you, Jessie, not you, me. You have risked your life already. You must not do more. It is me they want, not you. But the injured arm had no power to strike a blow. Jessie tenderly took the dirk from between the numbed fingers. Say your prayers, Tim, if you can remember any, said Jessie between long breaths for we shan't easily get out of this alive. There they are, see them? The witch wench and the boy. Ha-ha, my fine maid. You'll sing a more civil tune today, I warrant. Give us over the boy and maybe we'll let you off easy. The first man that touches him, I'll kill, cried Jessie. Curse her for a witch cried one of the men, recoiling before the fierce aspect of the girl. But Mofat was filled with the lust of blood and of fury, and with a yell of menace. He pushed up the boat against the narrow shelf on which the pair were cowering. Hand over the boy! A yell of pain interrupted him. Jessie, seeing better than she could be seen, had seized the moment and driven her dagger clean through the arm of the man who was seeking to clutch at the shelf. Just for a few minutes, the girl held her ground against the six furious men below, who, losing all sense of humanity at last, lifted their cutlasses and struck her blow upon blow, some of which missed their aim, for Jessie was nimble as a wild cat, but some of which fell upon her flesh and at last brought her blinded with blood to her knees. A stifled gasp close at hand told her of another deed of cruel cowardice. She turned to see Mofat wiping his cutlass and little Tim lying stark and dead at her very feet. 
At that sight, a strange Pharisee fell upon Jessie, forgetting her wounds and her weakness, inspired as it seemed by some spirit other than her own. She rose to her feet, her eyes blazing in her head, and with a loud and sonorous voice, she spoke the words of a terrible curse. She cursed the vessel whose crew had done this deed of infamy and shame. She cursed the men who had been the instruments of a bad man's rage. Above all, she cursed the master himself, turning her gaze upon Mofat with such fearful effect that he slipped back into the boat, and his men pulled away in the direst terror they had ever experienced. Next morning, Jessie Varco was found by some fishermen, seated on a ledge of rock, just above high watermark with the corpse of little Tim, whose life she had sought to save at risk of her own, folded in her arms. She begged them not to wake him. She called him her baby, her darling. When they laid him to rest in the churchyard, she would spend long days sitting beside the mound, gazing over the sea for the sails of the Black Prince. But from that day forward, the Black Prince was never seen or heard of again. Perhaps the crew, fearing to return to a place where they had done such evil work, changed its name and rig and took up life elsewhere. Perhaps she foundered in a gale or fell a prey to some enemy's ship, but no news of her ever reached Morinstow again. Somehow the story of Jessie's curse got abroad and her reputation as a witch was made forever. But she hardly knew it herself. From that day, she never fully regained her faculties, and at last poor Jessie's life was ended through a fall down the cliffs from the heights above, near to the grave of the little boy, and from whence she had kept a ceaseless watch for the return of the Black Prince, terrified alike at the thought of its return with the dreaded Mofat or of its destruction in response to her curse. The children will look fearfully down this chasm and whisper that Jessie leapt down it to expiate the curse. But whether or not this was so will hardly now be known, for her mind was never the same from the dreadful day when she risked her life to save that of the boy and saw him slain at her feet. End of section 19. Section 20 of True Stories of Girl Heroines. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Beth Fletcher. True Stories of Girl Heroines by Evelyn Everett Green Ursula Pendril The captain's face was so grave that instinctively the passengers exchanged anxious glances. He had given out that he had something to say to them, and they had assembled in the large saloon in full force. When he came amongst them, the look on his face was different from anything they had seen before. The cheery expression was replaced by one of clouded anxiety, and the infection of it spread quickly amongst the group in the saloon. It was not a very large number of passengers that the steamer carried. This was before the day of pleasure trips to and from India. Those who went to that land or returned from it only did so when necessity compelled them. The voyage was not the speedy matter it has now become, and there were far more hindrances and hardships than since the days of the Suez Canal. Still, there was a fair gathering to hear what the captain wanted of them, and it was plain that the matter in his mind was a grave one. "'Oh, captain, is there danger?' asked a lady, cowering upon one of the fixed seats and holding a little boy clasped in her arms. The keen blue eyes of the captain turned upon her for a moment and glanced away to the circle of strained eyes fixed upon him. He seemed to understand what it was that all these people were thinking— and hastened to reassure them. "'Danger! Nonsense! What put that into your head? The ship is right enough, nothing wrong there. 
It is quite a different matter from anything you are thinking of. There was a distinct look of relief in the faces turned towards him, and yet the expression of care upon the captain's did not sensibly lighten. I have in the first place one unwelcome piece of information to give you, he said. Although I do not think that any of you need apprehend personal danger or inconvenience, perhaps some of you remember the delicate-looking lady who was brought on board by her husband at Bombay, and whom you have none of you seen since? Young Mrs. Varden, queried a passenger, who had just known the name of the lady before starting. I asked the stewardess about her once, and heard that she was prostrated by seasickness. Some people never get over it all the voyage. Exactly. And that is what, until a couple of days back, we believed about her. She was always ill and ailing, quite unfit to sit up or leave her berth. But though the doctor saw her every day, he suspected nothing till a couple of days back, when the stewardess, who was taking care of her, and luckily looked after nobody else, the ship not being very full, was taken with a sudden attack like convulsions and died within two hours. That aroused his suspicions. He made a careful examination of Mrs. Varden's condition, and his suspicions were strongly aroused. On the following morning there would have been no room for doubt in any case. The smallpox eruption was out all over her. Today she is almost black with it. There was a shudder of horror through the assembled passengers. The thought that the ship was infected by that terrible disease was fearful indeed. The captain spoke on, doing his best to reassure them. Fortunately, the lady has been kept very carefully isolated. She was so delicate when her husband brought her on board that everything was done to ensure perfect quiet for her. She has occupied one of the little nest of cabins, all the rest of which were empty. The husband bespoke the sole attendance of one of the two stewardesses, and as my ship's doctor is a cautious man and was rather anxious about Mrs. Varden's condition, he has used every precaution himself, though he suspected as little as the patient or her husband that she carried in her the seeds of so dire disease. I can assure you with good conscience that I do not believe any of you have run any greater risk of contracting the disease than you might do by walking the street of any oriental city. Passengers on shipboard come to trust their captains in a way which is credible to that calling. Captain Donaldson's words carried weight, and a sigh as of relief passed through the group gathered to hear him. But one gentleman put the question that was rising in each mind. And what is it to be done now? The grave, anxious look returned to the captain's face. His eyes instinctively scanned those turned towards him. There is only one thing I can possibly do, compatible with my duty to my ship and its company and passengers, he said. Mrs. Varden must be put ashore at dawn tomorrow morning. Where? How? Is it possible to do it? Quite a little hubbub of questions arose, and the captain made shift to answer them all. It will have to be done, he said. I know the place where it must be done. We shall touch in and send a boat ashore. I have had to leave a sick sailor there before this. There is an old leper house standing near to the margin of the sea. For a long time now it has been used in the fashion in which I purpose to use it. Fever-stricken sailors are left behind, and there are certain conditions they have to observe before they can be picked up again if they recover. But when a sailor is so left, some messmate remains with him to care for him and submits to the loneliness and danger and discomfort out of compassion for a comrade's need. The thing is not so difficult when it is one of one's own men who is the victim of disease. He paused and glances were exchanged by the bystanders, and one tall, rather rough-looking Irishman, who had come from Australia and whose loud voice and hearty ways had made him something of a power on board, exclaimed eagerly, "'But look here, Captain. There is somebody there to look after the sick, surely. You don't mean they are just dumped down in an empty leper house and left to live or die as they can. There is somebody there to look after them and give them food and medicine and all that. Why... One wouldn't treat a dog so, to throw him ashore and leave him to his fate. It is like this, answered the captain gravely. There is no trouble about food and water and a supply of such simple drugs as may be ordered beforehand. 
I can make certain arrangements as to that, and the food and fresh water and so forth will all be duly left each day at the leper house by an Arab, who will be told off for the service. But as for getting help in nursing, that is simply impossible. I know what I'm saying. Money would not purchase it, and it would be such service, even if attainable, as I think an English lady would sooner die than receive. No, this brings me to the question which I have to put to her fellow passengers. Is there any lady on board willing to face the awful peril of taking the malignant disease, the awful loneliness of the leper house upon the sandy shore, with only Arabs near, the awful doom of dying alone there, or of seeing her companion and patient die, and of being, in that case, quite alone during the necessary period of quarantine, which must elapse before she can be taken off in another ship? Whatever man can do for making these conditions bearable, I will do. But none know better than I do the terrible nature of such a task as the one I ask from one of you. Nay, I do not dare to ask it. I feel that it is more than flesh and blood can stand. But yet the thought of putting ashore, alone and unconscious, that poor young wife, just to die, without the presence of a human creature near her, that seems an equal impossibility. Ladies, I do not ask an answer yet. I would not take an offer were it given. It must not be an act of impulsive generosity, should one of your number be able to face the terrible thought of such a sacrifice. It must only be undertaken after much careful and deliberate thought. The captain, with that, turned on his heel and went his way, leaving the passengers gazing mutely one at the other with pale faces and anxious eye. Just before he reached the companion, he turned round to say, Before putting the case to you, ladies, I have individually interviewed every woman in the steerage company to see if it would be possible to procure the services of one of them as nurse. But all of them have husbands and children. I have failed entirely there, and I may not spare my one stewardess even would she go, which I greatly doubt knowing the fate of her companion only a few hours ago. Amongst the passengers who had listened to this pitiful and terrible tale was one young girl, travelling from India quite alone. Her name was Ursula Pendril. She had stood rather apart during the captain's speech, and now, slipping away from the excited hubbub of talk that arose on all sides, she fled to her cabin almost as though some grisly phantom were at her heels, and, sinking down upon her knees on the floor, buried her head in her hands and rocked herself to and fro in a sort of agony. Must I do it? Must I do it? Oh, my God! Help me to see my way! were the words that fell brokenly from her lips. How can I? How can anyone? But, oh, that poor, poor creature, that awful death for her, for death it must be without any to care for her. Oh, God, help me, help me. There is nobody else, only me, to do it. All the rest have children, friends, husbands, brothers. I am quite alone. Oh, God, help me, help me. The broken words were merged in sobs as the tears gushed forth, bringing a measure of ease to the overcharged heart. Ursula sat crouched up on the floor of her little cabin, with her face buried in her hands and her loosened hair falling around her. But the sense of storm and strife was merging in one of a strange and settled peace. Down in the depths of her spiritual being, it seemed to her as though a hand had been laid upon her, and as though a voice had spoken in her ear, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of my brethren, Ye have done it unto me. Ursula Pendril was a girl of good family who had been left a year or two ago an orphan and with very narrow means. She was, however, a girl of high spirit and brave heart, and instead of asking a home with any of her kinsfolk, she preferred to supplement her small resources by working in various ways herself. The field of women's work in those days was much narrower than it has since become, but Ursula knew a lady who had been a nurse under Miss Nightingale in the Crimean War, and had since then given much of her time to the service of the sick. She was then in charge of a hospital, and welcomed Ursula on a long visit, 
where she learned considerable skill in nursing and made herself acquainted with the right treatment of most ailments. After that, she had often nursed private patients in their own houses and had traveled a good deal with invalids going to Madeira and other places in search of health. So that she was no timid, helpless girl, but a rather experienced and resourceful woman who would not easily be frightened or nonplussed in ordinary cases of sickness or in the ordinary circumstances of travel. But there was nothing ordinary in the charge which she felt had been laid upon her today. Yet no one expected this thing of her. Probably she would be the last person the captain would think of for such a service. Ursula was young, and she looked younger than her years. She had not talked about herself to her fellow passengers. She had not told how she had been taken to India by a delicate lady to look after her and her fragile children. She had not supposed that anybody would be interested in her private affairs. She was surmised to be one of those growing-up girls sent home from the perils of the hot season to their friends in England. Nobody would expect a young thing like herself to volunteer for such a deadly and terrible service. But the more Ursula thought of it, the more resolved she was to make this sacrifice. It seemed to her that she had received a message from on high, that she had been shown it was for her to take up the cross and carry it, and that if she did so in fearless faith and obedience, she would receive help and blessing and strength for the task. At dusk, she left her cabin and went on deck, and asked where she could find the captain. The officer she addressed looked at her keenly for a moment, and then pointed to where the captain was standing alone, save for the presence of the big Irish-Australian, with whom he was often in company. Ursula slowly approached, and the two men stopped talking and looked at her. The captain stepped forward. "'Did you wish to speak to me, Miss Pendrell?' "'Just for a moment, please,' answered Ursula, with a beating heart, but with outward self-possession. "'I came to say that I will go ashore tomorrow with Mrs. Varden and take care of her.' "'You, child!' ejaculated the captain incredulously. "'I am not a child,' answered Ursula steadily. "'I am older than I look, and I know a great deal about nursing. "'Once I lived in a hospital for a year.' I have taken care of sick people since. I understand about fevers, though I was only once with a smallpox case, and that only for a little while, as she was taken away when the symptoms declared themselves. But I have been vaccinated quite recently. I have never taken anything from a patient yet. I am not afraid. I will go with poor Mrs. Varden, if there is nobody more suitable and more efficient." The captain paced once or twice up and down the space between the rails, and came back to where Ursula was standing. "'There is nobody else at all. I have had the husbands, one after the other, or the relations and friends. Nobody can bear to face the awful task, or be spared to do it.' "'Yes, I understand. Other people have ties, so many to cling to them, to miss them, so many depending on them.' If it were so with me, perhaps I could not offer, but it is not. I have no very near relations. I have no parents or brothers and sisters. If anything happened, there would be a few to be sorry, but nobody would feel life to be shadowed. I am the sort of person who can do this thing. You are the sort of person from whom the world's saints and heroines are made, cried Captain Donaldson with a most unwanted outbreak of emotion. My dear young lady, I do not know how to accept the sacrifice, nor yet how to decline it. God will bless and reward you, I truly believe, for he only can reward such a deed as the one you are about to do. I do not want any reward, answered Ursula simply. I only want to do what is right. Suppose there were somebody very dear to me, it would be no sacrifice. "'And Mrs. Varden is very near and dear to somebody. "'To her poor young husband I saw him as he went off the vessel.' "'Poor fellow, yes, I fear—' "'But the captain pulled up short and kept the fear to himself. "'Ursula moved away towards her own cabin. "'I have a few preparations to make, "'but I shall be ready tomorrow when you send for me. 
I think I shall not come up any more till then. She disappeared in the gathering gloom, and the captain stood looking after her till a hand was laid upon his arm, and the deep voice of his Australian passenger said in his ear, "'Is that girl going ashore with Mrs. Varden?' "'Yes. She has volunteered. She has all the qualifications for the task. But I don't know now how to let her. That lonely leper house, that awful fear before her eyes. Mrs. Varden will not live the week out. But I dare not keep her on board. My duty to my passengers and to the company prevents it. But those two frail young creatures sat down alone. "'Look here, Captain. You may make your mind easy there. They won't be alone.' I shall get off there, too. I shall see them through. You, Mr. Kelly. Why, man, what do you mean? There is no accommodation in the Arab settlement, nothing but the squalid place and the leper house beyond. You cannot be in there. No? I shall pitch my tent just beyond, but with insight and sound. Jehoshaphat, man, do you think I have never roughed it in a tent before this? Do you think I can't speak the primitive language common to all races, enough to get those dirty Arabs to do all I want of them? Do you think British gold will ever fail to work the will of its master in any corner of the globe? You go and make all your palaver with the heathen chine or blackguard Arab, or whatever he may be. I'll pitch my tent, and I'll be there as long as any British woman is, and I'll see the thing through. As a nurse, I'm no good." even if a rough fellow could volunteer for the task where a lady is in the case. But I'll be hanged, Captain, if Brian Kelly will stand by and see that brave young girl and that poor dying wife left alone in a place like that without a countryman near them. I've nobody especially waiting me in the old country. They've done without me all these years. They can do without me a few weeks longer. I'll see this bit of business through. If those poor creatures die there, I'll stop and give them such Christian burial as is possible— if they live through it, I'll be there to bring them home. One or both. Confound it all, Captain. Do you think I'd ever know another night's sleep in my bed if I looked on at a bit of heroic devotion like that and walked on with me hands in me pockets? The captain put out his horny hand and wrung that of his Irish passenger. He had liked Kelly from the first, and now he felt a new and warmer feeling towards him. Heaven bless you he said rather hoarsely. You've rolled a ton's burden from my heart today. Before sunrise next morning, but while the sky was beginning to lighten in that wonderful way one sees in desert countries, a tap came at Ursula's cabin door. She was quite ready, dressed in her cool linen garb, with her white apron concealed by the folds of the long cloak. The things she wanted to take with her were ready in a modest valise, the rest were to go on to England under the care of the captain. Her face was quite calm and serene as she came up on deck. A few gentlemen passengers were about to see her off and wish her well. The captain made his way towards her and took her hand. Mrs. Varden has been carried to the boat already. We are ready for you. Mr. Brian Kelly is going ashore too. He is, in fact, there already with my steward bargaining about a tent in which he means to live for a time within hail of the leper house, so you will have a friend at hand in case of need. He, like you, is one of the lonely ones of the earth who can do these things. I am very thankful not to leave you quite alone with your patient. There yonder you see your future home, or prison. You will be quite safe there. You would have been safe even without Kelly, but I am thankful he remains too. I shall leave word at the nearest station what has happened. You will have friends looking after you, in a sense, whom you will never see, but Mr. Kelly will be at your beck and call. Now, we must be going. It was all like a dream to Ursula. The confused sound of voices, the earnest pressure of farewell hand clasps, the words of praise and blushing lavished upon her. Then the sight of the swathed white figure in the bottom of the boat that looked almost like a corpse in its grave clothes. The vivid golden glow over sea and land. The stretches of yellow sand, the white domes of the Arab settlement, and the square stone walls of the place to which she was bound. 
She only seemed to awaken to the realities of life when the captain held her hands in a last farewell and just stooped and touched her forehead with his lips. I have a little girl at home, about your age, he said huskily, as if in explanation. Pray God she may be as brave a girl as you, though may she never be so sorely tried. Then he was gone. They were all gone, and Ursula was left alone in this strange, silent place, with that sad sight before her eyes, poor Mrs. Varden, stricken down with that most terrible malady and in its most malignant and deadly form. The patient was quite unconscious and lay upon the narrow bed which Ursula found already neatly made up, muttering in the delirium that knew no lucid intervals. She was not violent, had never been violent, the doctor told her, and there was little enough to be done for her. But the thirst was constant, and Ursula seldom left her side for long. Although there was something so terrible in the poor young wife's disfigured face, yet it seemed to Ursula that she was the one link between her and the unknown. She did not shrink from her. She was as tender as though it had been her mother or sister. She shrank from no task that would bring relief or ease. She knew what to do, and she did it unflinchingly. And then, as the day went by and the shadows of evening began to steal over her, she went to the door to look at the sea in the sands and see whether it was a dream what the captain had said of that big Mr. Kelly staying behind, too. No, it was no dream. There was the stalwart figure pacing to and fro. There was the tent, picturesque and cheerful, with its fire close beside it, and a couple of turbaned Arabs cooking something over the right glow. "'Miss Pendril, I've been hoping you would come out for a mouthful of fresh air. And how goes your patient?' Very, very ill, but always in a stupor. I can leave her for a few minutes sometimes. Ah, good. Then we will have supper together out here on the sand. It will eat better to you than in there, and... Oh, but, Mr. Kelly, I am infectious. Stuff and nonsense, as though I cared for that. We are in the same boat as to that, for I helped to carry her ashore. But we needn't be more doleful than circumstances make us. I am peckish, if you are not... Do let us have supper here together. It was the first of many such meals, taken just in those moments when Ursula could leave her patient and run out into the fresh air. It seemed as though those Arabs must be cooking all day long, for there was always some appetizing dish ready, and, oh, the blessed relief of those odd minutes spent with one who could give word for word and whose eyes shone with friendly sympathy and kindly concern. Ursula said in her heart every day as it went by that but for this she must have died or gone mad. The captain had been right in his prognostication. Mrs. Varden sank gradually and by the end of the week passed away in her sleep and it was Ursula and Mr. Kelly who bore her to her narrow grave upon those spreading sands and it was he who filled up the grave that he had dug and bringing out a well-worn prayer book from his pocket, read over that lonely resting place those words of hope and promise that have been the consolation of Christian mourners for all time. Ursula did not take the fell disease. She was unnerved and unstrung for a time, but the quiet days went by one by one, and the consciousness of that watchful presence without kept her from any of those fears and tremors which must otherwise have made this period of waiting an agony to her. They met every day. They took their meals together and walked up and down beside the margin of the sea in company. They had to wait till the time of quarantine had gone by, but at last there came the blessed day when a steamer stopped and dropped its boat to fetch them, and the two exiles from humanity looked one at the other, and then at the great vessel awaiting them, and they knew that their time of trial was over. The passengers on that vessel were disposed to make much of them and laud the girl's heroism to the skies, but she shrank from praise, and she kept herself quietly aloof from the little world of the ship, till at last the day came when they steamed slowly into the beautiful harbor at Southampton 
and dropped anchor there. Ursula's few possessions were quickly gathered together. She stepped alone into the bustle of the great world where welcomes were being bandied about on every side, and every passenger seemed to have some loving friend or relative to greet them. Not quite everyone. A tall figure pushed its way towards Ursula. A strong hand possessed itself of her bag. I'll put you into your train, said Mr. Kelly, and she gave a little sigh of relief. He stood at the window holding her little fingers in his big hand. He looked straight into her eyes. I'm glad you've got some people to go to, even if they are only cousins. I hope they'll appreciate what they have got. I'm off to Ireland. I must see the old country first of all, but I shall be back in England before very long. When I come back, may I come and see you? She looked him full in the eyes. Her color rose. I have never tried to thank you all this time, she began. His big voice cut her short. The train is just off. I want my answer. May I come and see you by and by? There was a dew on her eyelashes, and her lips quivered. But the smile won the day as it beamed out over her face. The soft voice was quite steady, except for a little glad catch in it. And she answered, Yes. The End End of Section 20 End of True Stories of Girl Heroines by Evelyn Everett Green